That's beautiful. Right. 30, 34. Ready, set. Recording live from the E. Haley Memorial Studios, straight out of Elmont, Ontario, it's time for This Death Clock Has 60 Minutes, your one and only weekly Warm Hordes news broadcast. It's 8 p.m. Wednesday night, the beers are cold, the news is fresh, and the death clock starts now. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the death clock. Wednesday night, it's it's a pretty special night, Wednesday nights. Mm -hmm. Once a month, uh, George has managed to twist enough arms, Jason's managed to twist enough arms, that every once in a while... We get to travel to the mothership. We get to see inside the workings of Privateer Press. And tonight we have a very special night. Um, a guy who is a bit of a legend in the community who recently became a, a staff member at Privateer Press. And, and we got super excited to try to get him on the cast. And, and Will Pagani said yes. That, I was confused as you are. Yeah, I would, and, but <laughs> apparently, apparently Will needed shackles. <laughs> So he brought a ball and chain. Is what you're <laughs> I'm totally, totally kidding. Um, I told you we were looking under the inside from the outside in. Uh, actually, so we actually got two for the price of one tonight. We also got PPS Jackson, as most of you know him on the forums. We're going to call him Jackson for the rest of tonight's podcast. We are uh, broadcasting live from the PPS studio in the boardroom. Say hello, guys. Hello. Hello. I'm Will. I'm Jackson. Excellent. Um, so let's introduce you guys right off the bat before we introduce us, uh, because, well, everybody knows because they're listening to the cast. I hope they know who we are. Um, Will, give us sort of a, the abbreviated version of who you are and what you do at a Privateer Press. Uh, I am Will Pagani. I used to be a tournament player where I played in, I don't know, 10 or 15 events a year. Uh, I was on the USA team that won the World Championship in Poland. It was two years ago now. Uh, and at Privateer Press, they brought me on for development uh, and playtest. Awesome. Now, Jackson, um, people will know you from the forums because you're, you know, you're there quite often and you have quite a large community presence. Tell us who you are and what you do at Privateer Press. That's news to me. Uh, I'm Jackson Wood. The, the, the presence fine. I'm Jackson Wood. Uh, I'm the marketing manager. So anything marketing related, insiders, social media, videos, just any kind of copy that tends to go out goes across my desk or is written on my desk. There you go. Uh, well, right. we better introduce us. Uh, on my left, your right is the one and only PP or PG, not PP. You're a PG, semi-auto magic. Yeah. Um, say hello, George. Hello, George. And on my left, your right is the one and only Maelstrom. Maelstrom. That's me. Uh, did you have a good week in War Machine this week? Uh, yeah, I had a good week. Good. I uh, managed to assassinate uh, uh, the Menoth guy. High Reclaimer? No, it, was Z it starts with a Z. Oh, th one of those guys, right? Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> oh, little, you don't little, care? I, I top of two him with little three. Nice. And it was beautiful, and I had a lot of fun. And George, you've been playing Scorn. <laughs> You're getting your OTC list ready. Yep. my Both my OTC lists are now, actually, they're almost completely painted. I'm just finishing up the basing. Xerxes 2 and uh, Zal 2 are going to be stomping across the board in a couple of weeks. Sweet. Well, nobody wants to hear about us playing War Machine tonight. <laughs> what they really want <laughs> is for these two guys to talk. So let's get right into tonight's news because we've got a lot of news items. Um, and what we'll do is we'll mention what it is and we'll go around the table. And if, uh, you know, our special guests can comment, they can comment. If they can't, we'll just uh, wave, wave on to the next thing. Um, so first things first, uh, the ARG had an, a, a big release yeah, this week, well, and we, we will speculate ourselves as to what it is. I know that these guys can only talk about, we'll talk a bit about the ARG and the development of, of that, but uh, I think you got pretty excited about uh, the, the, the reveal. So um, as most people who know me, I love to speculate about stuff, and I love huge base casters. So I have forever been trying to figure out what huge base casters should be in different factions. Um, and my Kador picks were, of course, uh, Colossal Karchev, who would just be hilarious and awesome. And my other pick was Baba Yaga's Hut for the Old Witch. Oh, yeah, that'd be cool. And then when I see this video come out, and there is what looks like the Old Witch in her hut, traipsing across the battlefield, mm. I was 
very excited. Mm-hmm. Now, I have no, uh, no, we did not have a banana for scale in the video. That's so, so we don't we know. We have no <laughs> idea. It could just be a really tiny. <laughs> well, it could be on a large <laughs> base. You know, there have been casters. That be that it could be like it could be like Painter Thagrush with the tiny. Yeah, it's a tiny little <laughs> witch <laughs> on, being held by yeah. Scrap Jack. Yeah. All right. So uh, <laughs> let's send this out to to Will and Jackson. Uh, tell us a bit about the development of the ARG and you know this grand conclusion. Um, what's what's the buzz? Well, well, the conclusion hasn't happened yet. Right. Right. Yeah. Right, right. 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 The full conclusion is going to be at SmartCon this year. Which is this weekend, so make sure to watch for that. It's going to be pretty interesting. Uh, but as for the AOG in general, it was something that was cooked up mostly by one of our social media people, Valerie, um, as people know her. And there was a lot of work put into it on the back end, like tons of videos. A uh, whole Rosetta Stone was made for like the final bit of things. We were super impressed at how quickly that got solved. Like I'll deal with it over the weekend, and it took three hours. Very so, impressive from the community here. Um, there may be more secrets that I don't know about, but... I mean, I doubt everything is found. Yeah, I think there's like, a bunch of pictures were put out there and everything. Yeah, mm-hmm. so there might be one or two things that are still lurking in the shadows, as it were. Well, there you go, guys. So those people that are still doing the ARG, keep digging. There might be more. Uh, so we'll move on from that. We got to see a ton of new model renders, mm-hmm. which I know... Uh, I, <laughs> I'm pretty excited, and you just yeah. started playing Cricks, so you got super excited because yeah. we got to see the Hellslinger Wraith. We got to see the little blur yeah, description that yeah, goes yeah, into yeah. the can't store. Wait to see, I can't wait to see that his stats are. Yeah. Super excited. Super excited about that. Uh, do you guys want to make any comments on the Hellslinger at all? or well, I don't know. What do you want to know about? Well, you know, we need we like a second. stab line. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I would just be happy to know whether his guns are going to do something awesome. Uh, will the guns do something awesome? Well, he does have shot types, uh, much like a gun mage. Nice. There we go. He does collect souls like this one. Sweet. Sweet. So we can, we can kind of... Shot types uh, One of the souls. questions that uh-huh. came from the community on this one, and this actually applies to Kane 3 as well, and we may as well throw it out now, is... Did and with the pistol wraith and with things like Kane three, do you guys sort of build the fluff to build the, to go towards the stats, or do you go from the stats to build towards the like? Do the does the stats? Which do you guys create the model first and go to the fluff, or is it go? Which direction does it usually go? Uh, usually, we're given uh, fluff and sometimes art to go along with it, and then uh, the development team will kind of piece together stats based on that. And then, of course, we'll play test, play test, play test, iterate, 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 and end up with something that you guys will see later. Sweet. That's uh, that. That was as good an answer as I could ask for. Yeah. Um, the next thing we got to see is some, a Kador model. There is speculation that it might be a new Kovnik Joe sculpt. There's uh, speculation that it could be the uh, the Kador artillery captain. No one's really sure. George, you seem to know a little bit more about this. No, no. No, I don't really know anything more. I... I um I kind of like it as a Joe sculpt. I don't know that it is, but I kind of like his uh, <laughs> screaming "get them" pose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it uh, it has a, a vague commissar feel, which I kind of like. Uh, but you know, there may be people here who know. There's some speculation, gentlemen. Any 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 speculation on your end? It, it is, in fact, the artillerist captain, as per the. Ah, okay, cool. It is, it is not a new Joe skill, as cool as that could be. Um, but no, it's just it's the artillerist Capitan. Well, we might see some people use that sculpt, I think, to become their new Kovnik Joe or like <laughs> some slight alterations. Well, the uh, I'm I'm loving artillery in Mark Three. Yes. Or more to the point, I'm dreading it as it bombards yeah. me as I try and get across <laughs> the damn table. Oh my god, the dwarf artillery, I managed to get that sweet, sweet four die oh, dwarf go away ba- with that AoE oh, yeah. four pie plate the other day that was just oh, um, <laughs> so delicious. <laughs> sea King. Ladies and gentlemen, Sea-king. the Sea King. We definitely we've been excited about the Sea King for a while. I know the yeah. troll players are super stoked about it. Beautiful model. I kind of want to buy one just to paint the damn thing. It's gorgeous. Now, of course, you guys have heard of the Canadian conversion, right? Where you pull off that big ship and attach a helicopter to his head. Good luck getting that ship off of there. <laughs>
Holy moly, that model is huge, it by is, the way. It is massive. Like, it is probably the meatiest gargantuan we've released. Oh, can't wait to see it. It's it's hefty. Uh, Dominar Morgul, we've uh, got a chance to look at the Dominar. George, you're playing Scorn. What, you excited about the Dominar? I am. Um, it's nice to see a second unit. Uh, we, we've already got uh, Makeda and her constructs, but now we have Morgul. And it's interesting when you're painting Scorn infantry, it's easy to miss, but there are a lot of female Scorn. It's not just the casters, but there's a lot of female models like in the units and stuff. And I, I didn't spot that until I started painting, like until I had to hold every single model once, you know, um, when I'm painting them. Uh, I didn't really notice that. And it's really neat to see the two female um, uh, units uh, as part of the unit with uh, him. Yep. Uh, and I love his trench coat. The trench, the trench coat's, coat's awesome. badass. Yeah. Uh, gentlemen, any comments on Morghul's release? I'm excited for him. I think he's going to be really cool. I had tons of fun playtesting with him. Yeah. Yep. But that, that's good to know. It's always great to know. Uh, and we got to see the Scorn Beast Chiron all uh, painted mm, up, which yeah. was pretty sweet. Yep. Uh, like well, he's, 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 he's the line of the... Yeah, he's a... Are they called... Yeah, there's a Drake Basilisk and Kray yeah. Basilisk. So, he, yeah, he's the big Basilisk. And he does the same trick, I believe, that um, Bronzebacks do, where uh, Drake he he's the boss of Drake's. Um, and he is the... Beast that goes with the caster. <laughs> <laughs> so, really? Yeah, that's so you. Well, he's. I want to call him Zakar. Uh, the problem yes. is, I've just been back to Scorn, so I I don't really you're, know. You're a little name. rusty. Yeah, I'm a little rusty. So he's Zakar's beast. We've been seeing all of the battle box casters getting their beasts, or Jacks in Character. the case of the other side. And it's really neat seeing him. Um. Really like seeing him all painted up and seeing the the once I'm done my OTC list, I am probably going to uh, we're we're thinking about a journeyman league locally, and I'm thinking about doing scorn so I can try this brand new caster, and it'll be great to have a beast that I can expand out into. Cool, gentlemen. Anything uh, anything you want to add to uh, George's uh... <laughs> babbling? <laughs> Somebody. Somebody that sends out solicitations, I'm not going to point any fingers, uh, listed his ranged attack's name as Annihilating Gaze. Which it is. Which it is. Well, well it was, was named that. Uh, but he does not have the special rule Annihilating Gaze. <laughs> <laughs> it, it is now called Destructive Gaze to get rid of any confusion. <laughs> so it doesn't just destroy everything on the board like he wanted it to do, G. It does oh. not hit Mountain Kings at PAL 31. I so. really, that would have been amazing. Yeah, well, I just, yeah, yeah, I just, it would be. You know, <laughs> I'm not even going to, no. <laughs> All <Moving> right. On. <laughs> it's, it's time to hit the focus button because we're going to get into the, the nitty gritty of tonight's show. Hit it. Focus! Tonight's focus, uh, because we've got Will Pagani on and because Will was a, uh, I, I mean, Will, you were a top ranked a uh, competitive player for a lot of years and that is you know built led to you working for privateer press and i think what we really wanted to gain from this segment tonight was advice for those of us that are middle tier or bottom or, or fun bracket as we like to call it in our in our local area for those of us that are in the fun bracket and we're happy to be in the fun bracket but there's days where being in the fun bracket is kind of frustrating let's I, we'd like to get some advice from the master on how to kind of level up. How do you get out of the fun bracket and, and have that day at the competition that everything goes right? And the first question is, um, when we talk about leveling up and we talk about this sort of fun bracket, how do you progress from your first tournament and sort of get to that next tier? So I think playing games is the most important thing that you can do to, to get better at a war machine. Uh, there, there's only so much you can learn from talking to people about it, from reading the forums about it, from listening to podcasts about it. But when you play games, you're going to learn so much more, so much faster than you will by simply studying material. Uh, because as you're going through your game, you're going to be thinking about different options. You're like, oh, well, I can do this. 
and you can kind of play that game out in your head. You're like, cool, well, this is where that ends up. And then you can go, oh, well, I could also do this, and how does that end up? Great. And now you've kind of gone through a whole bunch of scenarios in your head, and you know, at the very least, a very vague way about what should happen in those different scenarios. So you can go through a lot of different paths in any one game. Uh, whereas talking about a game, you may not necessarily see those because the models aren't on the table. You don't know about the distances, uh, that kind of thing. Terrain. Uh, terrain is very important, and that never really ever gets brought up in discussions about models and stuff. Um, where scenario zones are, how you want to play in a specific scenario. Like a lot of those things never really get talked about. So actually just sitting down and playing a game of War Machine is easily the best way to learn about it. And I know Jackson and I went to lunch today and we were talking about uh, stuff like knowing what your opponent's models do is just as important as knowing about what your models do. And it's very difficult to learn what your opponent's models do when you're just talking about things or you're just uh, reading forums and stuff. So really getting in there and playing the game and seeing how your models interact with their models directly is easily the most important thing in my mind. It reminds me of when uh, playing that first game with Tim, where he he said, "If you have to ask me what my feet does on Denegra, I got bad news for you. Have <laughs> <laughs> a bad day. Yeah, you're about to have a bad day. That that is maybe maybe my top tip for f starting War Machine tournament level players is the first thing you should do when you sit down at the table is if you don't immediately know what the other person's caster does just ask for the cards or ask the, if you can see their list because there are so many times that i am as an organizer i'm wandering around and when i hear the words wait what does his feet do it means that that person has just lost the game because <laughs> if you have to ask that question Something has gone horribly wrong. If you have to ask it that late in the game. Yeah, like, yeah. this is not, I'm not talking about when I'm, you know, handing out scenario sheets. No, no. When I hear it, like, you know, at the 40-minute mark, oh, that gives me a horrible feeling in the gut. Um, so let's talk about sort of being in the middle of the pack. And so, so say you, you know, you're a pretty solid player. You've got some, you've got some good strat down. You've, you can usually get in, into that sort of top 10 seed. Do you have any advice to move up to the next tier after that? What did, what did you do sort of, what is your regimen? What is your practice schedule? Uh, so for me, what's important is identifying the meta. So what you think you're going to see at a tournament and then figuring out how to beat that and knowing your matchups is probably the most important part of uh, going from middle of the pack to the top end of the pack. Uh, once again, by playing games, that is the best way to do this. But what I, what I mean when I say this is like, if I go into a matchup and my opponent's like, oh man, according to the internet, this is an easy matchup for me. I know what I'm supposed to do here. But if I know exactly what I have to get done to win this game, and they're just like, oh, they told me it was easy, I should just crush this, I'm probably going to win that game. Because I know how... Like, I know why this is bad for me and how to mitigate that. And if they don't know why it's bad or why it's good for them and what they're supposed to be doing to make it good for them, they're going to have no idea what's happening in this game. And I'm going to have a plan and I'm going to be going to do it immediately. And that, to me, is one of the biggest jumps from mid-level players to the very high-level players is, hey, cool, I'm playing Ragnar into Wormwood. Everyone tells me that's a terrible matchup for Ragnar. Uh, I beat Tom Guan all the time. <laughs> like when, when we were back in Houston and we were playtesting and stuff, I don't like I beat him two or three games in a row with Ragnar into Wormwood, which if you go online right now, everyone will tell you is terrible for Ragnar. So But but you managed to have sort of a plan, you knew what to do to sort of build your build Ragnar towards that plan exactly. and execute it. Well, people will tell you, like, well, you can't charge into the forest because you can't get line of sight, and none of your beasts have Pathfinder because you're not playing a, uh, an Axer. And I'm like, great, that's fine. This is what I have to position to set up. These are the models that I need in my list to be able to beat this. And I can generate that template, basically, in the game, and that makes it very difficult for Wormwood. And if the Wormwood player doesn't understand what that's doing and how to beat that, they're going to have a bad time instead of me. This feels very much like the game we had on Monday, Will. Right, right. Where I was playing Xerxes 2, I, I didn't understand that what Xerxes 2 did was push forward and push in hard. And I, I saw your threat ranges and said, I got to step back 
and then I just lost the and game. And then Gun Bunnies shut you, you off the You were able board. to pick stuff off, and because I didn't understand what to you looked like, oh god, he's just going to stomp all over mm. me because I didn't have right. the the plan going in. I I just flubbed away what should have been a good easy win for me. Um, but hopefully, the game that you played there, you learned a little bit more about what your plan should have been. Well, now you now you you have a plan for us. Oh yeah, exactly. And that that is um, this sort of goes to anybody who's practicing um, for a tournament. Play into the worst possible matchups for your list. Yeah. Do it as much as possible and do it as often as possible. Go online and say, "Oh man, what uh, I I find it really easy to beat anybody. What lists are uh, should I be scared of?" People will tell you all these horrible lists horrible matchups for you play into that play into it hard because once you it, it's uh, it's the standard like training with weights thing right if you can beat the really hard match you can beat the easier match well it's it's like i right. i do to the local guys i make them play on 50 minute clock instead of 60 minute clock and then when they get to a real tournament they're like i have all this extra time it's amazing. <laughs> I remember in Mark 1 when we would play test for hardcore, which was uh, seven-minute time turns, we would play with four-minute turns during play test. And then when you get to the hardcore and you have a seven-minute turn, you're like, this is almost twice what I'm used to. Let's go. Mm -hmm. And it just it makes you so fast when you play with those lower clocks and just handicap yourself in that way. Well, I think we've also talked about this on the show quite a bit too. Is don't be afraid to play, like, especially with like our. We have a, a lovely, friendly uh, Monday night pub night uh, series of games that we've been playing for the last couple of years, and you almost feel bad bringing the big boogeyman list to those nights. But it's almost important when you're playing sometimes with a friendly game to play oh, it's the boogeyman, so that you get a chance to play them. There's nothing worse than showing up to a tur tournament and going, "I play ten games a week." But I've never played against Wormwood because my my friends are just really nice. <laughs> yeah, that that does not help you in a tournament setting, not at all. Okay, so back to the questions. Uh, do you have any other pro tips, either of you guys, to sort of uh, up your game? You have one. Oh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. It is. Uh, so my pro tip is always play with a scenario. Always play with a clock. Always, uh, if I mean, if your goal is tournament play. Uh, always have a list pairing and then present it to your opponent before every game. Even if they're like, cool, I'm going to play blah. You're like, cool, well, here's my two lists. Which one do you think I should play? Which, why don't you think I should play that one? Why do you think I should play this one? And then their insight can help you learn as to what list you should be playing. And that's just a really quick and easy thing that you can do every night. And you'll just gain tiny little tidbits of information as you go along. Jackson, you got any pro tips? Mine Mostly fell on the same line there. Um, I'm also a big proponent to play the same thing over and over and over again. Like, don't be like, I want to play these four casters. I want to build lists for all of them, and then I'm going to rotate through. Choose one, stick to it, play a bunch of games with that caster, get good at it so you can identify what strengths and weaknesses it has. Once you feel comfortable running on autopilot, then move on to the next one. Uh, the old 50-game rule. Yeah. Classic. Th th that has always stuck with me. Tim Banky said he never feels really comfy with a caster until he's had at least 50 games. 50 games under his belt. Um, do we have any audience questions about tournament and, and uh, competitive play, Jason? Uh, not really about competitive play at the moment. Okay. So we'll come back to the audience yeah. questions when we get into the roundtable. One, one last thing I want to ask before we get to the roundtable is this is something we always ask tournament players that we have on the cast what is the one weird thing or lucky thing in your bag that you bring to every tournament that people might not expect to be in there <laughs> I, no? I have 12 battle phone bags full of models <laughs> <laughs> any one specific thing all right mine is not in my bag <laughs> I, I don't want to know <laughs> <laughs> it's oh, I do. booty shorts yeah. Jackson likes to wear booty shorts to tournaments. Booty shorts and tank tops. <laughs> so you just win by pure... Um, intimidation? Intimidation. I may not look like it on the stream in like, my nice cardigan and my t-shirt, uh, but I'm a pretty active, like adamant rock climber and ice climber. So like wearing those things is intimidating because I'm super pale. <laughs> and I've got exceptionally strong legs. <sighs> <laughs> that is amazing. That's a new one. 
We've had what? We've had Advil was yep, the first was one. Um, water, chocolate milk, uh, <laughs> all kinds of different types of measuring tools, yep. bottle cap <laughs> openers. <laughs> and now? Booty shorts. Booty shorts. Booty shorts. And a tank top. Yep. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> all right. Uh, it's time for this evening's round table. Tonight's round table, we're literally just going to talk about uh, the stuff happening at Privateer Press. And specifically, the topic tonight is going from the outside, you know, being a fan of the game and moving to the inside. Um, and Will, since this is like literally just happened to you in the last few months, we're, and, and, and Jackson, I mean, you're relatively, uh, you know, new to that transition as well. Um, so let's start by, uh, talking about how you guys got into tabletop gaming in the first place. Let's talk about your sort of history to, to sort of give us a field for how you got here. Uh, so I actually started with the game Mage Knight when I was in high school. Uh, and it's a lovely game, but, uh, I very quickly jumped to War Machine, uh, right when it came out in 2003. So that was when sort of, I started with miniature gaming in general. I had done a little model painting before that kind of stuff, but and I just stuck with War Machine since then. It's been my main game for thirteen years. Jackson, what's your what's your route to the uh, to the little war dollies? Uh, mine was a little bit weirder than that. Um, I mean, I ended up being in Japan for a good while, and when I came back, I ended up getting a job at a hobby store, and sort of fell into it head over heels. And War Machine and Hordes was the game. That really just stuck with me throughout everything else. Um, so you moved, you know, you got into miniatures. How did you guys both get into tournament play? I mean, I mean, Will, we know that this is really a large part of your background. What drew you to tournament play, and, and why did you keep going into it? How did that sort of become a thing? Uh, so I've always been very competitive with my brother, and he and I kind of both picked up War Machine at the same time. We, we pushed very hard uh, in, in local tournaments, and then eventually, I had a friend who was like, I'm going to go to Gen Con and play War Machine. I'm like, cool, I want to do that too. And, man, I was really young, maybe I don't know, 17 or something at this point. Uh, so I just went with him, and I loved it and had a great time. So I just started finding more and more and more events that I could go to. Uh, and, yeah, it just compounded from there to the point where I was going some years upwards of like 16 to 20 events a year. I'm going to alter the question a bit for you, Jackson. Uh, how much tournament play do you get in, and, and what you know? do you love it? Oh, I do love tournament play. I'm also a pretty competitive person. Uh, I was never like top tier by any means. I was probably middle of the pack to upper tier at times, depending. Uh, the biggest tournament I got to go to, I just came out of the Colorado meta. So I went to the Rocky Mountain Rumble and stuff like that, and like that's where I really did, like, okay, I'm doing all right. Like, I'm confident, you know, confident, comfortable. I feel good about what I do. So, cool. So, um, you both, uh, you know, are playing in tournaments. You're doing your thing. How did you each get approached by PP or recruited? Uh, well, I applied for my job. Like, I didn't, they didn't they didn't come and pull me in. Um, but it was just before War Games Con last year. I applied. And Privateer Press was going to be there, and they knew that I was running the event, so they kind of talked to me there a little bit, um, had some interviews, and eventually they pulled me in just at the end of last year. So, yeah. uh, For me, I also applied for my job. Um, like Will, we were both <laughs> game store owners. Yes. Um, and I was getting ready to sell my business, and I applied on a whim, like, I maybe they'll pick me? Who knows? And that was back in April. And then I went through like a three month long interview process and then packed up all my stuff in a car and came out here. So what you're saying is first become decent at tournament play, second own a game store, Got it. third troll the internet until there's a job that fits you. That sounds like the way to go apparently. And if you're named Jack or Will or Matt, <laughs> those are the three names of the privateer. Yeah. Gotcha, <laughs> gotcha. Making perfect sense now. Will, you're in. I'm in. <laughs> you got awesome. the name for it. I can legally change my name. Yeah, you could. <laughs> Check that. Uh, <laughs> Damn. So um, now that you're, you know, now that you've moved to the inside, has your perspective changed on the game at all? Um. Yes. Yeah. Because I know a lot more stuff now. 
<laughs> I, I will say I was one of the guys that would kind of not necessarily make fun of, but like take jabs at PB. Like, why would you do this? This is ridiculous. It all makes sense. All right. Like everything that happens now has a reason for happening because of later. And there's tons of things down the line that are always being taken into account. Uh, and I know Matt posted on the forums not too long ago, a couple days ago, that we, we plan like three plus years in advance. So our release schedule is very far out and we're constantly trying all of these things and seeing where they fit and where we want them to go and all this kind of stuff. So yeah. because something changes or something changed from Mark II to the new edition, uh, all of that stuff has reasons. Yeah, they're not always going to be readily apparent on the outside, and that's kind of like I always I keep coming back to like community integrated development, like over and over and again. Um, it was a real push from us to be like we want to kind of give a glimpse on the inside of like here's a three month window of the future to some extent. Yeah. Like we can't give you three years, but take this little chunk and kind of get an idea of of what's going to happen yeah. and where we're going with this kind of stuff. And you might see where the pieces start to fall together and make the full picture that you weren't aware of was not the picture you were looking at. And and some of it's so secret, but like, I mean, sort of like this, this New Hordes faction, uh, you guys don't even know what the picture is, right? Like, we all have, we have all these little pieces and things have been spoiled uh, and we've gotten these little teasers and stuff, but you, know, you guys don't even have the picture frame to put it in. So it's, it's, it's all very exciting to me as someone that's like got to work on this kind of stuff to finally be like, here it all is. So I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to it. That pretty much answers every audience question, doesn't it? <laughs> it really it, does. Like pretty much every question you guys had in the last 10 so, minutes. That the, kinda... the way I understand that is it's kind of like going from a civilian to president of the United States uh -huh. and no. you suddenly have access to all the secrets <laughs> in the world. And you're like, sweet, this is how I'm going to shake hands from now on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh my <laughs> god. <laughs> <laughs> and then we suddenly were stopped at the border, and I didn't make it totally to lock got political and load. There. <laughs> and, oh, oh, we yeah, just I, got on the no-fly list. What's, didn't what's we? the next question, George? <laughs> well, I was. I, this is actually not the next question in our little show notes, but I I wanted to know if there was when you're looking at that big board, when you're looking at the big picture, are there sort of plateaus where the game is kind of finished for a minute like i know there will always be more releases or you're you know coming out with a new faction or anything but are there places where you can say yeah this is kind of this is kind of done for a second you know and before next week's release no <laughs> <laughs> things may be more firm in some regards like you might be like oh man this feels really solid this plays well together like a lot of these themes are coming together in a strong way and then, you know, a year down the line, we're like, hey, check out these three new models. Look at what that does to those models. You Redo it all again. <laughs> so that there's constantly new things that are getting put in that we're having to test for and go back and change things and go forward and change things. So, no, there's, there's never really any stopping point where we're like, this is great. We can wait two years and release it because we're just constantly modifying and updating. So that, that this kind of um, backtracks us a little bit and leads in a different direction, but with the re-release of Scorn, let's just say the complete redesign on Scorn, talk a bit about, I mean, if whatever you can talk about, talk about the, the process of working on that redesign and, and what that experience was like for you guys. Spicy. Spicy. Uh, well, I came in right in the middle of it, so I, I won't have all the beginning stuff, but I know what happened in the beginning was... Uh, tons of community feedback was collected uh, by several of the development team members as well as the marketing guys. And we sat down and we had a big meeting that was like, cool, this is what they want. This is what we can actually give them. This is what we think is reasonable. And we kind of went down that line and said, cool, well, what is this supposed to do? Cool, this is what they want it to do. Well, that doesn't quite work. We're going to give them this, which is kind of close, but not exactly what they want. And, some things. and a lot of that's going to be very similar to CID. Like, we're going to say, here's a... This is not a real model, but like here's an ogren with a bazooka that is, works for Signar. And then if somebody comes back and like, cool, we want him to have a jetpack and a flamethrower, <laughs> we're gonna be like, look, buddy, this is no, <laughs> this is not how this works. So there, there was a lot of requests like that for Scorn, uh, and obviously we can't do those things. But it was very interesting to kind of take the community feedback, and I think it gave us a lot of information for how we're gonna do CID. Uh, and then apply that to what we want for Scorn, how we wanted those models to come out. Uh, and that was 
interesting and a lot of fun, and I have played more games of Scorn than I think I have ever played before. Because <laughs> that was Scorn was not one of my major factions. And to couple onto that, like with CID in general too, it's going to sometimes be along the lines of like, as he said, here's this ogre with a bazooka. We're going to give you that, and then we might give you like concept art to go with it. Yeah, and that sort of stuff. Like this is the role we intend this model to fill. We don't want that jetpack, the flamethrower analogy to come back because it doesn't fill what we're trying to do at the time. Yeah. Plus, like, the concept art's been done, potentially. Which, which also ties into what kind of what you guys asked earlier, like, how do we build models, right? Mm -hmm. So we're going to have, like, what the model's supposed to do, what the picture is, and how can we achieve it. We do have an audience question that feeds right into that. Yeah, we do. Um, from Joe, Joe Tor Tortilla. Joe Tortilla. Mm. Uh <laughs> Uh, just wanting to know if you guys are happy with the feedback from the score Narada, and did you expect this kind of response, considering most of it has been very, very positive? Uh, personally, I'm very happy with it. This was kind yes. of the first project that I got to work on mm -hmm. that I feel like I really had a hand in, because I had a little bit to do with the first Narada that came out, but not a whole lot. Uh, so kind of like getting into a new job and then having your, your first thing go over really well, it's always a great feeling. So I, I, I'd say I'm very happy with it. Uh, surprised about the feedback? Yes. I mean, yeah, kinda. Our community has been a little spicy recently, so Vocal, to, yeah. to get some to get some good feedback is always a great thing, and I think it really shows that we're a step in the right direction. I agree. Uh, that's one of the things you see a lot. There's a lot of, I mean, there's forums and there's a lot of negativity and stuff on the forums, but it was really refreshing to see so much positivity about the score Narada and just a lot of good feeling overall about it. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, and I, th I think we can say the exact same thing with the live update that happened. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was really great to see everybody go, huh, that's super reasonable. And it was like, nice to hear our community, which I, I agree with you guys. I mean, we try to be the positive note, but it was really nice to have our community, which can be a little boisterous from time to time, <laughs> yeah. be like, no, nope, no, nope, that's legit. Fair. Totally fair. We tried to cover all the bases there and also be like, don't expect this all the time. We want to preface that. Like we try to be a lot more on point with messaging of like you don't have to worry as much. And and kind of clear about what we're doing, right? Like that was very important to us with the, the dynamic update was, hey, this needed to be fixed. We fixed it. We're not doing this all the time. <laughs> don't go <laughs> right. Because we've we've gotten feedback emails. We're like, cool, now fix blank. And we're like, this no. is not the point of this, okay? <laughs> this is <not> <laughs> We're not just fixing everything that the forums ask for us to fix all at once. Because yeah. these things take a lot of time and a lot of effort. So, and, that's so a, and there's a bigger plan. Yeah. When you have an entire faction to re-go over like you did with Scorn, or you're building a new faction, uh, like the one we're going to start seeing more information about at SmogCon, um, is there, what's the process of tackling an entire suite of models like that with all the interactions that you could get and all the different problems is is there a is there like a standard thing you guys do it's like abc or is it more of a well we've got all of these i wonder how this is going to work so it's it's very similar to my get good at tournaments uh you just play as many games as you can so especially for like a new faction, I came in and they were just like, here you go. I'm like, oh God, what is all of this? I think I played my first game with them like last week. Yep. Yep. So. And, and there's just so many interactions to think about and stuff. But I, the, I, like my first week here, they were like, here's this new faction, go to town. <laughs> and I just sat there with all the cards and was just like, oh my God, this is so much information. And just started playing games with it and started trying different things and doing all this stuff. And... I mean, it's, it's daunting, but it's, it's also a lot of fun. Uh, but it's really just play games. Like, get out there, make the changes you want to make. Like, we're talking about Scorn, for example. Hey, we think this would be cool if Mortal had a spell that made stuff incorporeal. Awesome. Is that going to blow up the world? Like, like are we going <laughs> to yeah. do this? Is it going to ruin everything? <laughs> so then, cool. Well, let's go try it. Let's go play the game. And, and we'd play four, five, six games with it and be like, okay, cool. This is how it felt like. This is what it was like. Talk to our opponents. Did this seem unreasonable? All that kind of stuff goes Make on. Some tweaks this. potentially. Yeah, and you can turn knobs between games. So like, do it again. Cool. Does this cost three or does this cost two? That kind of thing. So you have lots of options basically, and playing games is always the key. When you're working on a specific model, is that the sort of normal amount of games that you would get in 
for when you're looking specifically at that model. Obviously, you're going to be play testing the models in conjunction with others over time, so you'll get way more than four or five games singly in there. But when you're really concentrating on one, is that kind of the range you're looking at? Usually, I try and do that for each specific rule. So, like, if we're looking at, like, Makeda 1's new feat, right? Uh, that started out way better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that, one, that one took one game. Actually, I don't even think that Same. game got finished. Two games. I don't even think the second game finished. Hunger Fred and I played it too, and it just yeah, ruined they, me both games. They completed two games in about 20 minutes, and we're like, something is wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so it's bad. So it, it really depends on what's going on. Uh, and usually we'll try and change one or two things on a model at the same time, uh, and then test those things and see how that feels, and then go back and keep going through it all. So, for a model to answer the question, that many games, probably not. Probably a lot more than that. Well, I guess you have to also figure out how it's going to interact with all the other models in the game at that point, too. Correct, yeah, yeah. Because if we're changing Titan Gladiators, and we're changing Malakarn, and we're changing Pharah, like, we're changing all these different things, you can test multiples of these at the same time uh, and kind of gauge how each of those works. And as long as none of the rules interactions specifically interact, uh, you can usually get a pretty good feel for what's going on. We have an audience question. Yeah, uh, Alex Austin, oh, kind of in the same vein here, guys, wants to know when you're playtesting something like Mercs, where so many of the models can be spread across so many factions, does that make things a lot harder? Yes. A lot more things to take into account? Makes it hugely difficult, yes. Uh, because yeah. you have to go through and try it with all sorts of different combinations inside of those factions. You have to think about the interactions of all the warcasters from those factions with the mercenary models. You have to go through and make sure that you're not going to completely create some broken interaction in some faction and, and really work with all of those things. So yes, mercenary models specifically are very, very difficult. Do you have a horror story of something that was on a model at some point that was just so hideously broken that uh, it you guys just what, you put it on the table <laughs> once and then went, oh my god, this can't live. <coughs> May I? What's that? No, I can't. What's that? <laughs> I mean, no, no, I don't so. think so. <laughs> there is one, so but they close. can't tell us. They're, They're so close. It, it's, it's, <laughs> it's that well, bad. We can talk about Makeda. I can talk about Sure, it. sure. Go for that. So Makeda, when Hungerford and I played, the feat was you can suffer a point of damage to make Praetorians. Look, any any word any any Praetorian war model. It was I think it was Praetorian. So it would be played. Okay. Um, not die basically. Like they would suffer a point and they get a point back. But it wasn't like tough. It was slightly it different. Was, it was basically everybody always passes the top one. Yeah, and that with Ferox's was like I'm gonna run twenty inches across the table. Now you deal with me. <laughs> and, oh, and, they, and they can't die. They so can't die. Grievous wounds. Good luck. And they go knock down. <laughs> And so I was playing Severius 2 against that. Like, I'll just set everything on fire. Didn't matter. It was terrible. <laughs> um, and then the other game we played, like, I had to push into him to try and make it work. And it was like, oh, not Ferox's murder of the worlds. And they leap into everything, and I lose. So, yes, is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so let's talk a bit about Theme Forces because uh, I think people are getting pretty excited about Theme Forces. We, we've all got one or two or three now. Uh, we've had some chances to play it. But let's talk a bit about the development of um, sort of testing those Theme Forces. How, do a, how does a Theme Force come into being? Because, I mean, you guys have had to reinvent how a Theme Force even works in the last uh, three-year development cycle for Mark III. Uh, yes, so theme forces, usually we start with a, a fluff perspective here, so like Winter Guard or Trenchers or so forth, uh, or any kind of those archetypes inside of factions. Um, we identify what models we want inside that theme force. Are there any hugely glaring weaknesses? Can we fix that with a model entry that makes sense? Cool, they'll get thrown in too. Uh, and then sort of the benefits uh, structure will come from like, cool, well, how can we help out this theme force in one of the pieces? Or, cool, well, does this theme force really want to go first? Well, maybe it gets the plus one to go first. Does it want, uh, like, is it really slow? Does it want extra deployment? Great. Uh, that kind of stuff. And usually our goal with the theme force is to create a really thematic army, obviously, because it's called a theme force, 
uh, that the hobby guys can get really excited about because of the theme of it, and then something that the tournament guys can get excited about for the rules of it. Uh, one of my favorite theme forces that's out right now is Ghost Fleet. I don't know if you've seen me online talking about it everywhere. Like it's it's awesome. It's it's super uh, fun. And that additional one guy per turn makes a huge difference that a lot of people don't ever really think about. On paper, and, and I know. Yeah, and I, and I know a lot of people online do not like it or did not like it. Uh, but when you take three units of those guys, that's three guys a turn plus whatever you roll. So that that's like a very strong ability, and then. It gets the plus one to go first because if it can get up there very quickly, you can threaten very far with the guns on those revenants, uh, especially the riflemen. So it like it really wants to go first. Terminus is a monster. Terminus is a monster. Oh yeah. And then of course you have uh, the free models are always nice forces. So we, we always try and either give you like command attachments or weapon attachments or the things that will support the army that we want you to take to make it a fluffy theme army. Slinger. So, yeah, so the, I, I mean, I guess it's pretty obvious that the, the Hellslinger is a Wraith, so that can be included in uh, Ghost Fleet as well. Sweet. That- well, you know what's really funny? This is a good shout-out for Mark andre because we don't give him enough credit. He saw the Ghost Fleet theme, theme force. He's like, no, no, this is really good, you guys. Yeah. Like, this is way good. Everybody was complaining about it, and M.A. was like, no, no, no. <laughs> look at this. Look look at Super this. Good. <laughs> Super good. So fun. Have you... Uh, have you guys ever thought about releasing, uh, along with the Theme Force, a sort of sample army uh, as a way to not necessarily show the power of it, but to show at least the the idea of kind of where you're going with it? So we have talked about this, and we've been asked about it a lot on the forums. Uh, and in general, our response is we don't want to tell you guys how to play War Machine. We want uh, to give you guys the tools and we feel that the theme force, being in its restrictive nature, kind of gives you that army already. So, I know, I, me personally, I love like tinkering with lists and kind of finding what works. And if we just are like, hey, here's a list, cool, have fun, a lot of that tinkering is already gone. Uh, so a lot of people will miss that enjoyment and miss that kind of thing. We also tote the line, like, we say we don't want to tell you how to play it. We worry that if we do say, here's a thing, that's the way it's like people are going to do that, and they're going to be like, "No, no." Privateer Press says this is the way to play this. We're just like, "No, this is like it's this an option." A option, not the option, and we don't. I, I personally would rather other people figure it out and enjoy that feeling of like, "Oh man, I got this, and it's sweet." And I was the guy that did it instead of us being like, "Well, this is what you did." Hey, I, I mean, I agree with that. I actually avoid the uh, list forums a lot of the time. That the, that part of the forums because. I don't want to be influenced by what everybody else is doing. I kind of want to feel like some of that is my own. Even when I finally go, oh, this is going to be the best thing ever, and then find out, hey, yeah, yeah, that's been done a million times. But it's that discovery that's part of the fun. No, this is a very interesting thing because I, on the other hand, like to have a list that I know works because I have – there are so many variables already going al- going on in my tournament life that – if I can remove the variable of knowing that this list is at least good, then I know that the problem is pilot error, not some horrible problem <laughs> that I have generated by missing one model that should be in the list to make it tick well, over. That's fair. That's fair. So, I can see that. So kind of my response to that is uh, that should be the community's job to build those lists. So that's where totally. the Tom Guans, the, the Jay Larsons, those kind of people come in and they can... And the, Andre LeBlancs and Banky can and and that's JVM's. been their purpose, right? Like that's that's something that's 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 they can claim as theirs. And it's the playing the list over and over again. Like those people are gonna play that list a bunch of times and really figure out where it can shine. Absolutely. We do have another question from the forums, I believe. The forums. Uh, I'll let or from the uh, from the chat when you get a chance. Not uh, from the forums. No, we from don't our, go there. From our, we don't go there. It's <laughs> it's a dark. It's a dark. It's a very silly place. Um, that's not true. We spent a lot of time. There. Unfortunately, yeah. <laughs> um, with the CID coming up, how are you going to separate? Uh, you, know, you talked about this a bit. There's always like the crazy, like we just want. We want our caster to be the ultimate best caster and kill everybody on the board. That's what our feat should be. How do you separate that from the good input? What is, what is your sort of criteria? 
It's usually pretty easy to tell. <laughs> it is right now. Someone who's been going through a lot of the forums recently being like, cool, what are the complaints from blog? Cool. What do people like? What do people not like? You can usually tell pretty quick the people that just have completely ridiculous statements. Like, I mean, I don't know if you want. I'm, I'm going to give an example and maybe I shouldn't. But somebody was like, I think pistol rates should be three points. I'm like, that's... <laughs> no, you can't do that. <laughs> Right, like so. So it's usually pretty obvious uh, what's going to be helpful and what's not. Uh, post length is usually a good thing as well. If they wrote a lot, it usually means they at least invested the time, and you should read it it's, because people that give us little one paragraph feedback or like three sentences, maybe that's helpful. Probably not because it like didn't really explain all of the interactions and everything they thought about. But if they spent the time to write four or five paragraphs. That's probably something that's at least a little more thought out and usually has in-game experience where they can tell you about the specific interactions. And it's, it's too far, I would say. Like, on my end, at least, like, when I push through things, I like some of the shorter ones, like, if there is thought there, because something that is succinct and points out, like, this is a problem, here's why I think it's a problem, and actually gives a reasonable answer. Sure, if it's three sentences, yeah. you can read it in two seconds and be done. Yeah. And if it's just something ridiculous, you can be like, no. And yeah. if it's something great, you can be like, yes. And you can, you can have those big, long yeah. paragraphs that just don't accomplish anything. It's true. It's true. Uh, so I, just, I think... I think part of that is so what you're saying is is those guys that are trying to post feedback, make sure you take the time to think it out. Give your, you know, if, if, even if you're giving a too long didn't read, make sure that that's a well thought out yes. um, thing. Yes. Not just my thing is bad, make it better yes. is not going to get Why is it bad? You know, how can we make it better? What would you like to see it do? How can it accomplish the goals that we set forward? And what weaknesses do you see? And, yeah, and, and we have... Uh, stuff planned that are going to that is going to kind of explain how we want feedback to be uh, given to us during CID and what we're going to be looking for. Awesome. Well, that answers a lot of people's questions too. Yeah. When so you're we're going into CID and obviously we'll see a lot more about that coming up and exactly how it's going to work. Um, but one thing I'm interested in is with the rise of everybody having a video camera and um, you know audio recorder and picture taking device in their pocket, are you guys going to be accepting other than just written input? Is there going to be, are people going to be able to submit videos and maybe even like probably not bat reps because nobody wants to sit through two hours of some guy pointing to his model and saying it's broke. But um, it's true. <laughs> is, there go is there going to be um, a multimedia component to that? Uh, I not Currently is the answer. I would be very surprised if we ever did anything with audio or video. Uh, pictures are probably doable with our current system. Uh, uh, so what I want to leave off this section, then we'll take some audience questions because uh, Maelstrom has been kind of collecting up a few questions. We'll kind of jump through a few of those that we can. With you guys, we know that you guys are thinking three years ahead of the release. At least. At least. Uh, releases of whatever. We're giving to give you a chance. Use one word to describe the next three years of War Machine. It's a loaded question. It's totally loaded. Um, and well, I mean, describe describe. It, we, like, I mean, taking away the one word, that's a George question. Like that's a truly loaded George question. Absolutely. Taking that away, talk, let, you know, with this, you've already talked a bit about. Um, you know, seeing behind the veil, are you guys excited about the next three years? Or is it just, you know, like a wall of fear? We are. No, I, like, I'm a very excitable person, just in general. <laughs> like, oh, my God. You were talking about rules that we couldn't put on things. Is it time for barbecue boars? Yeah, let's talk about barbecue okay. boars. So one of the rules that we were talking about was for the Pharaoh Battle Engine, when it was destroyed, you put two battle boars in play. <laughs> that were on fire that immediately charged something with flame, <laughs> with flame trail. So if they based it, it would be set on fire. And I about lost my mind in that meeting. I was like, That's oh, amazing. That could ever happen in our game. Logistic, <laughs> logistically, it doesn't work at it's all. It's a nightmare. 
<laughs> like that is amazing. I think we should house rule that immediately. It's being house ruled. It's already house ruled. <laughs> yeah. So exciting to be in the, all these meetings and be like, oh, God, all these things are happening and this could all be cool and real and great. And some of it doesn't work out, like our barbecue bore idea, probably because we have to make new models, make new cars, like Whole line do of everything, get the, like a paragraph or rule, like forget all that. So not, all that got thrown how out. How did it work with not Yeah, Pharaoh how did it work stuff? in not Pharaoh Army? There's a million disasters with this plan, but it was super exciting. And pretty much every meeting we have here in development, uh, I get really excited about stuff. I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be incredible. People are going to love this. This is going to be what everybody wants to play with next. This is going to be all the cool stuff. So. I mean, I'm, I'm a very excitable person, so maybe this is like not the best thing to use, but I'm super duper hyped for all the stuff coming down the line. Like, I'm, I think just the creativity that goes on in this company is incredible, and I'm very, very happy. And Jackson is the marketing manager. He's just like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I have to toe that line of like, everything I do is on that edge of like, can we talk about it now? When should we be talking about it? What's going on? I love everything we're doing, and that's not coming from the marketing, like the marketing glove of like, let me let me feed you some stuff. Like, really, I love coming into work every day. I'm a play tester here too. Like, we pull from a bunch of departments and a bunch of places to do stuff. I get a hand in this, and like, I have a lot of fun. Our meetings are amazing, but the next three years are gonna be insane. Tomorrow is going to be insane. Tomorrow is going to be insane. Whoop, whoop. Yeah, we got to be tomorrow. Oh. Yeah, like so, tomorrow. So gonna something's gonna happening. Like for us on the inside. Friday is going to happen for everybody and you're going to get to see most of the picture. You'll get to see the picture. You'll get part see, of it. You'll get to see the picture, but you will not necessarily know how it all goes together. And it's going to be awesome watching what comes out of it and how everyone puts it together. All right, Maelstrom, I'm going to give you two audience questions because okay. then we got to get to the lightning round and cut this short. Okay, I promise this one. Uh, a friend of ours from Brazil would like to know. Okay, I'll just I'll just read it verbatim. Uh, as we see an increase in community communication, yes, I would like to know your standpoint on community-based translations. <sighs> don't, don't ask me that question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <sighs> As far as community-based translate, oh, I got you. I mean, okay. You can slap me if I'm wrong here. <laughs> as far as community-based translations go, I doubt there will be any official stuff. Uh, like for like you get stuff early and you can translate it for your community, but mm -hmm. we can absolutely uh, encourage you to do it post-release and things like that. We okay. We just do not necessarily have the means to do it on our end. Correct. Yep. Like it's it's a huge undertaking, and we've worked with partners to do it for France and Germany, and it's it's, it's, a, it's an adventure. <laughs> well, it's really speaking a speaking as a guy who has a television show that plays in fifty two countries around the world, if you don't understand how difficult translation is for a thirty minute television show, which has approximately five pages of dialogue, that just to get it right, yeah. like that is. It's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous undertaking. So, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's rough. Yeah, our right. rule book is 22,000 words. Yeah, Ooh. yeah, that's it. That's a lot more than we... And, and it's just little misleading things, especially when there's, like, rules nuances. Think about that for mm. a second. Yep. Yeah. Some things do not translate. All right, last question, Jason. Uh, last question. I'm going to give this one to Bilac, I guess. Uh, with, with dynamic errata updates... Should we expect big changes in July, or are the years of the twice a year big errata gone? Uh, so the we we no longer have an errata schedule, meaning okay. there will no longer be a six month errata period. We will simply errata things when they are required to be errata. That's awesome. And if something comes out that totally destroys the game, we'll fix it. If we have to curtail that. We hope to curtail it with CID. Oh, yeah, obviously, CID. One of the huge like portions of this is, hey, I mean, for example, one of the big ones that got caught right after the errata was the Bow Kerr was not allowed to be attached to Warlocks because it's never been in a Hordes faction before. And none of our internal guys caught that. So in the, the Scorn errata, which happened about a month later, we fixed that. And that's, that's kind of the stuff that we're going to be looking at in Dynamic Updates is little clerical errors will get fixed. Uh, and then large game-breaking things uh, will get fixed. I love that. Hopefully they will be less and less and less and less Correct. to the point that they rarely, like, we hope they don't get seen often in the first place, but 
if, if they do need to be fixed, they will be fixed. And I think Daryless is kind of a an excellent mirror uh, to kind of show the nerfs and the buffs here, right? Like Daryless mm -hmm. is not really functioning at a point uh, where we felt that he was useful in your list, and you were required to take him with more Nevra. So we fixed that. We we took him. We took spell slave off the guy that could only cast. I think it was two spells, uh, both of which were offensive nukes, and gave him abilities that we hope the more never players will enjoy and use, and that play to her strengths. I think everybody seemed incredibly excited about. Oh uh, yeah, huge. Daryl is having tune up. <laughs> that's a huge. Yeah, yeah. huge so, thing. so that's that's the kind of stuff we want to do with dynamic updates. If something is legitimately not function, that is the point that we want to step in. Love it. That's a great. All great right. I want to thank everybody who came on the live cast tonight and asked your questions. I'm sure, sorry that we couldn't get to all of them, but there was so much to talk to. But I it's think we answered. <laughs> I think we answered yeah. almost everybody's questions in one way or yeah, another. Yeah, there which is, is there cool. is a lot of answers there. Um, so uh, time for the lightning round. The lightning. Yeah. All right, it's the lightning round, ladies and gentlemen, and. I mean, I feel bad. I, I, you guys are just like. Do you guys just want to take a nap? Do you want to go get, <laughs> just go get like, some ice cream? Just like I've go already <laughs> gone for an ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> nice. We're gonna All right. ice cream after this, and maybe Mexican food. <laughs> oh, Mexican food in Cali, uh, you know, in the in the West is uh, pretty good Mexican food. Yeah. All right. So um, because we got this weird delay happening with your voices, what I'll get you guys to do is if you know the answer, raise your hand and buzz in at the same time. So just make your noise beep or whatever you want. Yep. That way, if some somebody's talking over you, I can judge who got to go first. Bubba does the bing bong. Yeah, Bubba, whatever, whatever you need. <laughs> For those playing in the chat, just try to answer your questions. There is a delay, so you guys will get to answer before these guys know the answers. And uh, for those of you guys playing on YouTube or Facebook or any of the other places that this thing plays, um, it's it's all about personal glory at this point, really. Uh, I know quite a few people who listen to us in bulk when they go to events, and they all try and beat each other yep. to the to the questions in the car. All right, so question number one: Is everybody ready? We're ready. Yep. What it? What is the name of the new faction? <laughs> huh? No, nobody's going for that one. Uh, <laughs> Jeff. Damn it, uh, Jeff. Uh, I, I've got a smart ass answer. No, just, just we're, we're going to call him uh, Phil. Yeah, that's Phil. Yeah, that's they, a good try. <laughs> all right, all right. It was, it was. I tried, everybody. I tried. You two were days. Two more days. You, you can't bugging. wait. Two days. <laughs> I can't wait. It's hard. All right, all right. Question number one: What is Ryan 2's three attack types? Ooh. Oh God. Who's Ryan 2? Ryan the Hellslinger. Ryan 2 is one of the two people attached to Kane's. Anybody? Oh. Anybody? Um, I'll give it a shot. Go. Will. Black Penny, Brutal Damage, Shadow Fire. <laughs> you got it right. That is, that's <laughs> one point for you. I told you I. Brutal. brutal. That's what I thought. Yeah. I told you I felt bad for you. <laughs> All right. Question number two. What is Ryan 1's three attack types? Oh, come on. <laughs> Will. Snipe, brutal Damage, and Mage Storm. Uh, it's actually Black Penny, uh, Brutal, and Snipe. Oh, they start with a star attack. That's right. That's right. away entirely? Oh, no, they're star attack. Yeah, there. Yeah, <laughs> Other thing. I missed the Black Penny. You missed the Black Penny. Question number three. What does Fenris's leadership ability offer to Doom Reavers? Well, in Mark II, it was silence, and they don't have to preserve. Yeah, that... that what, is they, what does I, it I, offer I, I don't know in Mark III. Will... Uh, silence and Doom Reavers do not have to berserk. It's actually relentless charge. Relentless I charge. I've been in a long time. We're gonna look. It's all right. It's all right. I made these specifically really difficult tonight because I'm like <laughs> these guys are just gonna waffle through the answers. Question number four: What does the spell backlash do? Eh. George. Um, every time the jack that it's cast on uh, takes damage, the warcaster suffers one damage. Yes, totally correct. Super legit. You've killed me many times with it, so I hope you know it. Hey, mom loves it. Qu question number five. How many boxes does a Northkin fire eater have? Ding. Five. Will Pagani. Five. It's five. It is five. <laughs> question number six. Okay. Even the pig. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Question number six. Five. What does immovable object do? 
<laughs> the power a movable object. It's on Tiberian. <laughs> It's, it's George. George. Uh, no push, slam. Uh, can't be placed. There's two more things. Uh, can't be knocked down, and loves poppies. I don't uh, know. Can't be. Will. Can't be thrown was oh, the last of one. Of course. So Will gets all the points. I'm just kidding. Uh, question number seven. What is the razor worm's animus? Ding, ding, ding. Go. That would be a spiny graph, I do believe. It is spiny growth. Yep. yep. Jackson's on the board. Ladies and gentlemen, Jackson's on the board. Oh, good. <laughs> Question number eight. Can't read his own handwriting. What is the speed on a grotesque banshee in the control range of Abbey 2? Nobody knows. Nobody plays grotesque banshees. Eh. <laughs> Seven? It's six. Eight. It's actually nine. Wow. So, wow. Ain't nobody got that. It's seven one. plus two it's for being. Plus two? <laughs> what is this? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Your, your question will be wrong in just a uh, second. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. <laughs> I'll I'll save room right quick. I probably got something <laughs> wrong in my translation. It. Uh, don't benefit from it. Oh, they don't? Oh, uh, I screwed up. So it's only seven. No, All right, not, there we go. We're not part of her battle group. Oh, then I screwed that up. Life goes on. I get I, the point. You do get the point. <laughs> I actually get two points for for figuring out my own you. my <laughs> erratic my <laughs> questions. Trigger Alpha Hunter. It's not just inner control. I'm watching you. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. You should be. I'm terrible at this game. That's, that's why, why I, he runs it. That's why I run it. Question number nine. I have the feet. Dragon's breath. Who am I? Eh. Callus 2. You are Callus 2. Question number 10. <laughs> Will. <laughs> I don't fucking know. I don't get that stuff. I just get the rules. All right. Question number 10, which is the Minty Fresh question of the week where I had to channel Minty because he's busy this week. When Kane was thought to be a serial killer, what name did the town folk give him? Oh. Ooh. I have not read that book. I have, but man, it has been a while. Is it Hellslinger? <laughs> It is Hellslinger. Oh, oh Folsen! <laughs> the, win the winner of tonight's game is none other than Will Pagani. Totally unexpected. Pulled that out of his... <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, totally unexpected. <laughs> Man. What's the name of the All right. It's true. All right, before we go this evening, we got to give our shout-out to our local friendly gaming store, The Wizard's Tower, who makes sure that our lights are on and makes sure that all of you have a full list of models because they carry a one stock of everything, which they is do. super awesome. They also have a great online presence. If you need to buy some models, go to the Wizard's Tower. Mm -hmm. Also got to give a thanks to Crooked Mile, who uh, makes sure that we have beer in our pockets. Uh, or in our... <laughs> well, sometimes I have them. It depends that, that, on what that, I'm that, doing that, on a Saturday that, night. That, the first beer is in the glass. The second beer is in the mug. The third one is in right the in the pocket. <laughs> Perfect. Uh Guys, I want to thank Privateer Press so much for letting you guys come on the show and for being a part of and being so active in the community. Um, I don't think people really understand how active um, just the whole gang at Privateer Press has become in the last little it's while. Crazy. Oh, yeah. Um, it's, it, it's amazing to be able to communicate regularly w with you guys, with guys like Dallas and with guys like Doug. I got Doug trolling me on Facebook. I, I know. <laughs> you are his personal nemesis right yeah, now. Yeah, just, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he needs to get his kicks because he's not here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so if you want to try to find us, we're all over the place. You can find us on Facebook. Come and like us on our Facebook page. Mm -hmm. We are under Moose. Just look up Moose Machine. Um, we are on Twitch. We broadcast every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. You can join us here. Every once in a while, one of these guys gets to uh, comes and regales us on the cast, which we're super happy about. Yes. Um, you can subscribe to our podcast, which comes out the day after we do this recording. Um, so those of you that miss the cast, I don't know how you're listening to this because you missed it, but you can, wow, I'm you can impressed, subscribe yeah. to it. Um, so if, basically, if you, if you can't find us, you're doing the internet wrong. Guys, uh, I'm going to leave. I'm going to let you guys have the last word tonight before Maelstrom hits the button. Any, anything you want to say before we go? Will Pagani. I'm excited for New Hordes Faction for the tournament players. Sweet. Ooh. Anything you want to say before we go, Jackson? Um, yeah. That's it. 
<laughs> yeah. He wants to say it, but he can't. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I want to say it. There's so many. <laughs> I broke my key. <laughs> All right. George, say good night, George. Good night, George. Maelstrom, good night. Good night. Hit that button. Dice down. <clears throat> we did it. And this death clock has